Hello and welcome back to On The Mic with Mike. I am Mike Jarvis and this time I'm joined by another very prominent Montserratian. Prominent Montserratian this time around is Mr. Vaughn Barzi. Mr. Barzi, Vaughn, as we all know him, is very, very involved in the quote-unquote diaspora, particularly in the United Kingdom, where annually he coordinates the Montserrat Heritage Day, Heritage Festival event that's now become a big national Montserrat Diaspora UK event. But I'm speaking with Vaughn. Vaughn is in Montserrat as we speak. So first of all, Vaughn, welcome to On the Mic with Mike. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. And as I said, you are in Montserrat at the moment. And well, we've had a bit of a challenge to put it diplomatically in getting this up and running because of the electricity outages that monsters have to cope with and that you have encountered so given that i mean you are a 150 percent thoroughbred monsteration yeah, and definitely. you mm -hmm. have the authority to speak on these issues being back there what what do you make of all of this? How has it affected you? And I won't even ask what do we need to do about it because we need to sort it out. But give me your perspective on it. Well, it's uh, over the last week or so, it's been a daily occurrence and it goes off for hours at a time. Um, today, luckily, it's, it's it's been off already today, but luckily not for hours as it was yesterday. And it was off for several hours several hours yesterday it, it's a it's a it's a, a, a travesty that Montserrat has I, I, the last count I heard was eight generators and solar solar fields and they cannot get seem to get a, a, a reliable electrical um source it's just so unreliable I don't know they the at times the tourist border advertising for people to come and work in Montserrat, but it, it, it's not possible if you're going to have this sort of outages all intermittent and regular. Well, here you are, slash, there you are in Montserrat, um, mm -hmm. having to cope with this as many other Montserratians have to do, and this has been going on. Anyone would say it's been going on for too long, but right. the point is you are there in the midst of the most important election campaign we've been saying in yeah. practically the past 30 years. And with this happening, certainly it must be a campaign priority for the politicians that you've been hearing. No, I know it hasn't. And that, that's a, a, a surprise. And it's frankly shameful that nobody seems to be addressing it. Munstrat Mike, has a, a geothermal well that I, I, I don't know if it's if, if right. I'm saying it must be there for about nearly 10 years now. Uh, it may, I may, that figure might be wrong. It might be a few less years or a few more years, but roughly about 10 years, we've had geothermal wells. And nothing has been done to, to bring, those, bring that on stream. I mean, geothermal is A, it's a green energy, and B, it would be cheaper for months rations. Um, I saw a, a tender went out sometime late last year, early this year, for a 1.5 megawatt head end. That's a ridiculous amount. It's not even supporting the base load of Montserrat. You need a geothermal, a geothermal electricity production that could could serve all of the base load and be away and has excess for expansion. Unless they're, they're not expecting people to come back to Montserrat. I don't understand why we're going off for such a, a, a little thing. Plus, and I, I'll, add, I'll add, giving Montserrat wells, um, they dig the well, but not give you the head end. So I'll, I'll put this analogy. It's like someone giving you an airplane. They say they're going to give you an airplane, and you've got everything you need in the airplane, the pilots, Got the cockpit is fine. It's got everything the cockpit the, the pilots want. The latest AV on it. The the passenger place is right. You've got leg room. You've got everything. But then they didn't give you the wings. They tell you, oh, go on out and find the wings. 
for this airplane. That's what they're telling you with the, with the geothermal. They've given you the well. Now go out and get the head end, knowing full well that you would not be able to get it. The, how can you get head end and go out and, and, and purchase head end? The person who's going to give you head end need to go back and go over the wells and make sure they're compatible or whatever with their bit of the kit. It's, it's, a, it's a nonsense. And it, it's, it's tell it. <laughs> It's like, as I say, it's like giving you, giving you a plane but not giving you the wings. And then you have to go and source wings that is not compatible with the plane that you got. And even though you've got all the latest bits in the plane, you can't fly it. And the donors of well, the donors who gave the well knew fully well. It's, it's deliberate and duplicitous as far as I can see. Well, that's a, a, a very pointed analogy that you've made there. And, and as we're speaking here, Vaughan, um, just looking at uh, a prompt I got to, just a, a while ago that came from the governor's office in Montserrat. And let me just backtrack before I come to this bit of information, because there's been talk about, I think there's a, a solar facility installation, and it's, to the best of my knowledge, functioning to some degree. Uh, just a few months back, we had a team of engineers from the British military who were in Montserrat during a site survey of the electrical grid infrastructure to advise on how do we resolve the problem with the electricity in Montserrat. And there was a previous intervention, I think, by the governor's office when some folks came in from British Virgin Islands, uh, et cetera, and were advising, at least that was an absolute emergency situation. But then that might have been last year. Well, as we were speaking just a while ago, I got a prompt from the governor's office. I'll just read it quickly. It says, today... Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Sarah Tucker, met with the CEO of Green Crowd, a Mr. Gambetta, who is in Montserrat this week, to advance work on a possible renewable energy roadmap, working with the government ministries, local businesses, and the Governor's office. That has now been accompanied by an invitation for residents on Montserrat to attend an event, a public meeting on Wednesday, the 2nd of October. That's that's this coming, well, that's this week, Wednesday, 2nd of October, to share your views on renewable energy opportunities here, renewable energy in relation to agriculture, ecotourism, and other industries, uh, the blue economy, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the one hand, I think, it could be said, well, somebody is at least talking about it, but we've been talking about it for quite a long time. And I'm having you in this conversation because, as I said, you are a very prominent Montserratian, quite possibly, I think, the most prominent unofficially Montserratian in the United Kingdom at the moment in terms of your outreach and your organization and your contacts, etc. What do you make of, of all of this? I mean, Something apparently is being done. Yes, I, I won't swear on your program, Mike. Um, this is a nonsense. I don't the the, the green energy or the this uh, renewable energy with regard to agriculture and with regard to all of those things. All we need right now is energy in with regard to supply for the local population. So if you get the supply to the local population, whatever else they need it for, it will be there. The agriculture, with the fishing, whatever else you need it for. They're not doing the supply to the, just the basic supply. Supply a full base load from the geothermal. Uh, it's not rocket science. I know for a fact, Mike, that there was a, 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 a proposal for a head end on the geothermal and the guys who were going to do it did some research, was ready to go, and also wasn't ready to go, was willing to go with it, but they were unable to get insurance for their, their investment. They couldn't get any insurance because of the state of Montserrat, because Montserrat's in that state of, I don't know, whether, I don't know if it's emergency or I forgot the, the particular category, but no insurance company would ensure them to put their equipment in that corky where those wells are and get the 
get the infrastructure onto the grid. So they pulled out. And I spoke to the governor about it. And I said, you, you need to lift the restriction so that people can come, because nobody, no insurance company exists. They're, they're not going to invest 40 million pounds as it was and don't have any insurance. So, so would that be a situation where the government of Montserrat or the British government would need to be a, a, a guarantor? I, well, they just need to lift the situation that insurance comes in, you wouldn't need anyone to guarantee or guarantor, you wouldn't need any of that. The, the situation would be stable enough that insurance companies looking at it will say, that's a fair risk. It, it's, a risk it's a risk I'm willing to take. And they insure the company. At the moment, because of the, the, the categorization of whatever that is, insurance companies are not willing to take the risk. And I, I can't blame them. I can't, if, that's, if the risk is too high for them to, 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 to come in, then they're not going to come in. And a knock-on effect, investors aren't going to come in and put up and invest money to... Um, that they can't. There's no assurance that if something happens the next day, they've got no, no. They've lost that investment. Now, when you speak of restrictions, what yes. restrictions are we referring to? Are we referring to the the restrictions as per the no entry zone restrictions, or are we speaking of restrictions in terms of a, a governance type? emergency type situation? What kind of, emergency. from the conversations that you've been having with the officials there? I think it's emergency emergency restrictions. At the moment, Cork Hill and everything south of Bellum, there's, I don't know what the restriction, I don't know what the, the exact uh, terminology is, but it, it was a restriction is sufficient that insurance companies would not progress to insure anybody uh, that that particular in investment so you know this it's a yeah, it's a it's a nonsense i don't see the point of telling people about green um or renewable energy for this that and the other without having the basic renewable energy for the population the population will then invest and grow into whatever they want to do with the with the green investment. They, I don't see how you're going to have renewable energy. You'll have renewable energy, but you don't have any in your home. You don't have it, it's so intermittent in your home that you can't you can't do anything particularly progressive. And it's ruining many appliances, fridges, televisions, all you name it. Many people have lost them because of the surges of, of the electricity and the intermittent and interruption of, of electricity. I hope I get the chance to speak with the management of the Montserrat Utilities Limited about it. I'm going to put in a request, I hopefully, at least to have them on the podcast to explain you know, what the situation is, why this keeps um, being prolonged the way it is. Yeah. Now, here you are, you are in Montserrat, as I said, you are a a person of substance, you are high caliber Montserratian. While there, you mentioned um, having contact with the governor. Have you been having any contact meetings, formal or informal, with the the government and other officials and authorities um, there? Then no, no, because um, um, parliament is dissolved, although I see that. So, in effect, there are no MPs. When you dissolve parliament, you're, not, you're no longer an MP, although I see some of them carrying out official functions, uh, I don't know why, because when you dissolve parliament, you've got no, you've got no ministerial status. You, you're not, you're no longer a minister. Well, they continue the next... in a caretaker capacity in a sense, yeah. Yeah, well, you're a caretaker per se, but not to do official or make decisions or all of that. Certainly. So, so having, there's another point right here to, to case in point, having your, um, your, energy people come now when you haven't got a government de facto you just have a caretaker government you haven't got a government that could make decisions for the next term is 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 a farce why why are they here now why haven't they come one month later when there is a government in place it, it, it's, i don't see the point of having them now and having talking to people as to what they want in the in the in the country or what you want regard to agriculture what you want regard to fisheries and all of the other topics you just mentioned what is the point of that when you haven't got, there isn't a government now because the parliament has dissolved. You, you're, not, you're not making any, 
decisions on behalf of Munster the people you're supposed to represent because you're no longer an MP. Uh, so, it's, and to, to tell you something else, Mike, and the, these people who have, who are going to come here and, and invest, they were going to make their money back by producing hydrogen with the electric, with the excess energy. The geothermal would produce more than is necessary for the base load of Montserrat. With the extra um, electricity, they produce hydrogen, as you may or may not know. All over the world, companies, major companies, developing hydrogen cars, trucks, planes. Yes, yes. Hydrogen. So they were going to produce hydrogen, which also could be could replace LPG, your cooking glass. So Montserrat wouldn't need to import cooking gas. You, they'll fill the bottles with cooking gas. When you burn hydrogen, you get water, water, water as the as the byproduct. Burning hydrogen doesn't give off any any CO two. CO anything. two. Mm -hmm. Yes, it gives off water. That's what, that's it. That's what you're getting in burning hydrogen. They'll make hydrogen from electrolysis with water. So you get hydrogen and oxygen, which is the components of of water. They can have the they sell the oxygen and the hydrogen separately. The oxygen for various things you do with oxygen, whether it be welding or in hospitals or in whatever else. Or and the hydrogen you use for your LPG, you develop, you have research into converting existing inter, internal combustion cars to run on hydrogen so that you can you you don't need to import all that fuel. You wouldn't need to import the fuel for the the generators now because you'll be using geothermal. So that will reduce, that will have, nobody will be paying all this high fuel surcharge that they're paying at the moment. That Because when you pay when you pay your electricity bill, there's a fuel surcharge, depending on what the oil prices were when they purchased the oil. You wouldn't, you'd need, you wouldn't need all of that. And that reduces the cost of living, which is a, a, a horrendously high in Montserrat, the cost of living, which I haven't heard anybody in, in the political arena addressing either. But all of these, just that geothermal will bring so many benefits to Montserrat, which is like hydrogen, and I say, running your vehicles on hydrogen, cooking on hydrogen, all of what is produced in Montserrat. Instead of importing stuff, we could now export, we export hydrogen cooking gas or whatever for, for people in the, in, the, in the local area, in the local Caribbean, and grow that economy have people here, high quality, technical jobs, um, developing, researching, doing all that on ways of using the hyd hydrogen and new ways of using hydrogen and oxygen, byproducts of what you're doing, all, all of which will be, get, will be free in Montserrat. All of which is free. The water there to make the hydrogen and the oxygen, the geothermal to put in, in, the, in, the, in the thing, all of that will be free or so free to access. Access. Yeah, so here you are clearly wearing a hat as a, an investor or someone who is scoping out investment possibilities, maintaining that interest. Here you also are at the height of an election campaign for what yeah. we're all saying, and I think agreeing is just about the most critical, pivotal crossroads moment for Montserrat. Yes. What is your assessment, being that you are there on the ground, you've been clearly been looking into, checking out, getting a very good overview of the situation on the ground. What, is, what impressions are you forming? Uh, the impression with regard to the elections uh, is, is disappointing. The, 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 the candidates are not addressing the problems that Montreal has. Cost of living in Montreal is astronomically high. Right? Everything you get in Montserrat is imported, very expensive, not often, often not of the best quality because they can't afford it. Right? It's, it's just too high. Uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, what to say? The cost of living is, is imported. You could say, I, I would say, right? I mm -hmm. would say the cost of living in Montserrat is the only thing that is manufactured in Montserrat successfully. You could stamp on that cost of living. You could stamp on it manufactured in Montserrat. It give, it give you, let me give you an example. Uh, by, I'll demonstrate this. If for, your, your fridge has been 
destroyed by the power outages. So you need a new fridge. You go online, or there's some some enterprising people go online and buy a fridge in, in America. Online, you buy a fridge, say it's a Black Friday sale. You get a fridge for $1,000. These are just top... These are just figures off the top of my head, not actual figures. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, be, they'll buy a fridge for $1,000 because their fridge has been, has been done. When that person, having bought a fridge and, think, and thought that they've saved money, which they, they need to do because the cost of living is high, get to months, right? The first thing they do is charge them on the freight that they've take, they come to come here. And there's no direct freight from America to Monster. You have, probably have to go to St. Martin and then transfer off the boat in St. Martin to another boat that comes to Montserrat, et cetera. So that, it's a high charge of freight. So the Montserrat government will charge them some freight charges, that on, charge them on the freight that they've come, they've come to do it. Remembering that that's not a direct fitting, um, shipping, shipping thing. Then they'll charge them on duty on the, on the fridge. But the, you'll show them the receipt of the fridge, say, look, I bought this for $1,000. They'll say, no, that fridge looks like, oh, you probably paid $5,000 for that fridge. And they'll charge you duty on $5,000, not on what you've actually paid for it. So the cost of that's gone up. Then on top of that, they'll charge you a consumption tax. So by the time you got the fridge that you thought you paid $1,000 for, you're now paying $6,000 that you probably can't afford and need to take out a loan for. So that, that's a, a government-imposed uh, cost of living excess that you that needn't be needn't be at all I and mean, i don't see why they're doing it it's just just too and and this is affects obviously because of most things coming by coming up almost everything is, is coming it affects everybody it pushes the cost of living up for everybody those who can and those who can't afford it yeah well just like uh the electricity situation the cost of living has yes. an across the board impact yes. I, and i I, th I could recall uh, several of the politicians across the board talking about it but solutions and i think i've heard solutions. a few ideas um it's popping up but given where we are is it time from your perspective and again drawing on your experience while you're there is it time to have a a sit down, a review, and as I've been phrasing it, a reset, come up with a plan. This is where we are now. And these yeah. are the sort of things that we need to put in place to move Montserrat yeah. forward. I mean, one of the previous uh, guests I had on the program said there are a number of key things that Montserrat needs to do. And no longer can we do them one by one. We now need to clear the deck and get all the critical yeah. things and start working on all of them at the start same time. Start again. Long overdue, long overdue. Um, uh, I'll talk about the, the, the cost of living as a government imposed thing. And if you think, and I'll, I'll throw some figures out there, they're rough figures, but the, the government is trying to raise $55 million from just over a thousand taxpayers. This, the, 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 from the census, September 2023 census. There were 4,386 people on Montserrat. If you, do, if you divide that 55 million by every person, even a baby born today will owe the government $12,539 $12, each. Now, that's an horrendous amount of money. Same from that census, there are 2,256 households. So if you break it down and say, okay, not everybody pays, just the household pays. Every household would have to pay twenty-four thousand three hundred eighty-nine dollars just to furnish this fifty-five million pounds debt, fifty dollars debt. And if you take it down to the taxpayers, if you say that it's only half of the people in the households pay taxes instead of two thousand, it's one thousand something paying tax. That comes up to forty-eight thousand seven hundred sixty pounds sixty dollars per year per person. Now that's an extraordinary amount of money. That's before they get anything else. They have to pay the government that much just to furnish that $55 million um, tax um, that they're trying to raise to furnish the budget. Now, that's an impossible figure for, for anybody to go, especially the lower paid. And there, and, I, and I've looked it up, is something like 700, 740 retirees and 106 unemployed people. That those are people who don't pay tax normally. And, and you think these people, even though it's a... a, a 
uh, what do you call it? The people just cannot afford to pay the, 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 the what is what is imposed upon them. So they they're in a planned sort of poverty. I saw some figures somewhere that over forty percent of the people in Montserrat are living below the poverty line. Now that's a ridiculous amount of money that any government should be ashamed of that figure and do something about it. I haven't heard anything much going on on the political sphere. They, they all mention all the cost of living. They haven't come up with many solutions. They, well, tell you, they, they tell you their story about, oh, I was poor, I know how poor it is, but they're not making any solutions how they're going to get the people who are now poor out of poverty. They got out of poverty. Now how are you going to get people who are now poor out of poverty? Well, from a pro professional perspective, you've clearly done your research and your homework on this one, and you've sort of taken us down a path that I hadn't mm -hmm. even originally mm -hmm. anticipated. But just to stay on this line for a moment, if yeah. we are looking at the uh, the numbers that you just threw out there, the people who are retired or who are on pension or who are on social welfare, um, yes, the retiree, the pensioners, they would have made their contribution. But that is a chunk of money coming out of the government's budget to take care of those people. I have heard during the political campaign about adjusting the income tax threshold, meaning you earn more before you start paying. That's less money directly going into the government yeah. coffers. Uh, it's yeah. one of the things that we're looking at is that a lot of these, you ask yourself the question, well, how are they really costed? How are you going to recoup that money, particularly from a government, an island that is in budgetary aid support yeah. from the United Kingdom, unless you bring in some investment that the private sector and the government by extension starts earning some extra money beyond local taxes and UK aid. Well, um, that, that and is... I mentioned that because you spoke about the potential investors in the geothermal project. Well, uh, one, one way that I... I think, and I haven't put it to the test, but it's, it's worked in the United Kingdom, it's worked in St. Martin, I don't know. One way of actually boosting your economy is to, um, I don't know to say declare, or say that Montserrat is a free port. Have Montserrat as a free port. So the things that go, comes into Montserrat would be cheaper for the people here to buy. And like in St. Martin, when people leave Montserrat, for instance, and go to St. Martin to shop because the things there are cheaper, if Montserrat's a free port, Antiguans, Kittitians, Nivisians, all these people would come to Montserrat, or many of them would, to do their shopping and to do other business because it's a free port. As they do in the UK when, they, when there's a free port um, um, declared, yes, it, yes. It, it, it boosts the economy in the, in the local area. Throughout, not just in the place that 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 the free port is, but around the, the local area. So, if you make Montserrat a free port, instead of trying to cripple everybody with the, the taxes as they enter, you make it a free port. You have people from outside coming to Montserrat to spend money and boost in the economy. With economy boosting, then you get a knock-on effect, and you you probably get more people. Mon Montserrat needs people. It's not it's not going to grow anywhere without people. Without, I mean, a thousand, two thousand people, it's it's not gonna grow uh, of any of any note. So you need people to be coming in, spending money. So you, by declaring a free port, that would help. That would help to get Montserrat on the road to getting. It wouldn't be overnight, but on the road to getting to getting it out of this sort of out of this sort of area where it's it's virtually bankrupt. The, the other point, Vaughan, as you are presently in Montserrat, in the midst of this very, very important election campaign, the Crossroads yeah. event, as we've labeled it, straight question, you are residing in the United Kingdom and you've been doing some fantastic work amongst the Montserrat community in the UK. Can you vote in Montserrat? <laughs> I can. It, it's a. I can now because I had. A, I had. A, I had. A, came to make sure that I can, but many people can't, which is. It's a. It's a. Uh, great on me, 
they, in order to vote in Malta, anybody from throughout the Commonwealth, say for Australia, Zanavatu, anywhere in the Commonwealth, can come to Mansra and have the same voting rights as Mansra. Live here for 36 months, do whatever it is, and, and you have the same Mansra, and there's no difference. No, Mansratans can't go to any of those other Commonwealth countries and, and expect the same treatment as their citizens. Yes, I do recall, just to interject quickly, I do recall a situation in Barbados where a number of Montserratians who were living there for like over a decade, two decades, actually had to take the Barbados government to court in yes. order to get the right to vote, yes. as, a, yes. as contrast that with the situation in Montserrat. Exactly, exactly. So if you take Barbados, for instance, if you're Bajan, you could come to Montserrat and have this, exactly the same um, privileges as a month's ration, but a month's ration going to Barbados wouldn't have that same privilege as a as a Bajan. So you know they need to they need to sort that out somehow. Sort it out. It, it's just not good enough that month's rations in Montserrat haven't got the same hasn't got uh, citizenship as I would put it privileges, and other people have other other um, quite Commonwealth countries have in Montserrat. Well, it's reassuring to know that you can vote because it's been a, a pretty controversial, contentious issue. And there was a recent development with a Montserratian lawyer, Mr. George Kernan, who I think made such a strong case because he's been trying to get on the voters register for quite a while and he was being rejected. And yeah. the decision that has now been made in his favor could quite possibly, well, I think the, the voters register has uh, closed, uh, I think as of the 20th yes, of yes, September. Yes, but yes. Uh, it is a pretty far-reaching decision in his favor that would have yes. some additional knock-on effects. Think, Plus, he's it, also now a candidate. And I, I should be speaking with George. I, I hope I do get to speak with him as well. Let yeah. me shift gears quickly to something else, because... Uh, uh, this is such a fantastic uh, conversation as it stands. From your perspective and the work that you've been doing among the Montserrat community in the UK and the festival that you've been coordinating, the Heritage Festival, that will be ongoing. But clearly, the planning starts now, not to deviate too much from what we're talking about, but how is that coming along and uh, how, how is that being integrated with what is happening in Montserrat as well? well? We haven't got that many strong links with Montserrat per se, but although we do say we have the greatest number of Montserratians in one place, even more than we have in Montserrat when we have the Heritage Day. Um, the, the planning is uh, for next year, which is the 30th anniversary of the volcano, is to have some something special. I don't know what it is yet. We haven't planned it yet, but it's 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 in the pipeline. Well, that's very, very encouraging to hear. We certainly look forward to that. And for the remainder of your time in Montserrat, are we, as you said, well, we have a government that's still in caretaker mode, even though some, well, governmental activities are, are continuing. Your lobbying efforts, your outreach efforts, how are those going? Uh, it's hard work. It's hard work trying to get anything done in Montserrat. Uh, with regard to, and, and I, I must, I can't do this without mentioning access, because everybody's on about access. I hear everyone mentioning the access, the island of the Twin Otto and both aircraft, access, but they're both obsolete aircraft. Um, it's baffling as to why people want to continue these aircraft. The other stall aircraft, the short takeoff and landing aircraft, that are better suited to Montreal and have better, better statistics with regard to landing, takeoff, et cetera, payload. The Islander, for example, is more expensive to maintain if the parts are available because it's now obsolete. They, very few people make parts, so I think they stopped making parts for it. So you, it's very expensive to get those parts. And it uses the most expensive fuel, so and the most rare and expensive fuel. So then again, it's it's difficult to get. Um, it's not It's not just getting 
fuel for, go and fill up. It's special. It's a special effort to get the fuel for the for the islanders. So all of that increases the fares because you've got the running costs now are that much higher than they should be. Were it not an obsolete aircraft, and was it to you were it using um, fuel that is uh, that is used in other in other airplanes? So I'm not so keen on putting forward a case to keep the islanders there. You, you need to get much more efficient, much more uh, up-to-date aircraft which can give you the access at a, at a, at a, at a less cost. The, the running costs for these cases are so so high that the, the fares have to be high in compensate for the running cost to cover your, to cover your costs. So you need uh, to get planes that are very much more efficient to get to get to get their cost down, and the people can't afford. If even they get the access right, there are people in Manzo who can't afford to have a return trip to Antigua, even even in an emergency, they can't afford it because the costs are so high. Yes, uh, and I've I've heard some mention about getting a different type of aircraft or the Technam model or some something yes, of the that brand. Of Yes, and uh, and then the, the the ferry situation. But as you said, um, underpinning all of that is the actual cost of yeah. travel from yeah. Montserrat to the next closest point, which would yeah. be Antigua. Vaughn Bazi, you are mm-hmm. originally from Cork Hill in Montserrat. Yeah. You have touched just about all of the important basis of issues pertaining to Montserrat's development from the point where it is at the moment. Yes, we could have gone on to talk about health and education and and so much more. And I'm certain that at some point we'll come back to to all of these. So what is your your area of speciality at the moment? Um. (sighs) I I don't even know I don't even know what to tell you, uh, Mike. I'm dealing with, as you know, I used to work with BBC and do their uh, te- technology engineering. So I go into buildings, I sort out problems, I make sure that in contracts, when you set up a contract, when when you set up a contract, you get what you have specified. Quite often, contractors take it upon themselves to change. Thing, get a bit cheaper, get a bit different, get a bit, and don't give you what you specified so you don't get what you need the outcome to be. You don't get the, the quality and everything else that you need. Um, so I'm sort of the troubleshooter that go in with, with the contractors, sort out that we have got what we need, get it correct, make sure it works, test it, all of this sort of thing. So it's a, it's a, a, a really exciting sort of job i like it but hey yes well as i can say you'd certainly have your finger on the pulse of what is happening in montserrat it's an absolute pleasure speaking with you sorry you were saying no saying you said i'm from from cork hill but yeah i think i I, I mentioned cork Cork hill is what i call a a forced abandonment there 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 was a, a a people forced to abandon Cork Hill and all of those areas around there, the most productive and the most fertile areas of the country were concerned. And there now seems to be an effort to keep it, a concerted effort to keep it abandoned. Well, I think there's a new conversation starting, and I sense there's some pressure mounting to open up those areas, particularly yeah. for for agricultural purposes and and it's, and so forth. And I've heard that on the campaign trail. Yes, yes, but there needs to be a concerted effort to get it all done. I mean, those are the most productive areas of the country, yeah, all those like Leeds, Cork Hill, all, all of those areas, and there seem to be this effort to keep it abandoned and not not there, there's no effort there's no real drive to repopulate that area what would your continued interest certainly but definitely involvement in these issues pertaining to Montserrat going forward what is that going to look like going forward well it's been 30 years of banging my head trying to get 
things moving. I'm going to continue to do that. I'll, I'll try my best to, if it, if it means getting people to come to Montserrat, because you need, as I said earlier, you need people. Montserrat needs people to come back. And the, I don't know if it's the government or the whoever else, need to put some in incentives in place that people return to Montserrat or people come to Montserrat to live, to stay, and not just to pass through. You need people to come here and come to stay. And um, I can't see that it will progress without people, an, an influx of people coming and helping to build Montserrat to something better. We don't, it's not point going back 30 years and say we want to be back there because you'll be just going 30 years backwards. You need to start from where we are and make a leap forward, take all the technology and the, all the interests of things that have moved 30 years forward and come from there, from this point forward to get to try and develop the place. And no doubt, Vaughan, you'll be part of that conversation. Hopefully. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed, Vaughan Bazi. Right, uh, thanks, Mike. Good to hear you.